Yes, so today's topic is um, basement propping schemes, essentially. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about what we need to consider when we're working on basement propping schemes. And I'm going to share some photos of our designs in action. Uh, we have experience in all sorts of basement related temporary works, which include extending basements down, uh, propping basement walls um, to enable the demolition of the ex existing ground floors, underpinning design and designs of berms, things like that to restrain existing walls. Um, as a part of this, we found that our expertise is best utilized at an early stage to advise on sequencing for schemes. Um, because that way that you get the most out of us as a company because we can provide a more efficient solution uh, to how to construct the new basement or how to uh, work around the existing limitations of the current basement. Um, so what's involved in an assess assessing a basement wall and what needs to be considered? Um, firstly, it's worth noting that it's an incredibly varied um it's it's incredibly varied every solution to every project um is not going to be the same and that, that that's the biggest thing to understand every project will have different uh, limitations and different load conditions um so it's not a one solution fixes all kind of a problem um of course, the main item of concern is the stability of the retaining walls. Um, there's a high level of risk associated with basement property schemes. They are often adjacent to roads, other buildings, infrastructure. Obviously, if they're near roads, you may need to go through AIP submissions, um, things like that for, with the local authorities um, to show them how you're restraining their infrastructure. Uh, there's a potential need for underpinning structures that um, to prevent undermining them if you're going down right next to them. Um, and there's always a degree of uncertainty when working in the ground. Um, another thing is there's multiple disciplines all working in the same space, um, piling, steelwork potentially, uh, underpinning, temporary works, permanent works, all kind of working together. And the sequencing of that is critical. Um, any temporary propping scheme will need, need to not clash with what's currently there, not clash what's going to be there, and may need to work around enabling a piling rig to get in and pile between props, things like that. So it, it's, it's complicated, is the sort of way of saying it. <laughs> um, water levels think, um, and in the, the local area may need to be considered. You may have a hydrostatic uh, pressure head that is significant to the propping scheme um, and information on the existing retain walls is key the more we have the more likely we are to provide an efficient scheme um, and buildability is is key uh, so load into a basement retaining wall um, obviously Predominantly, we are retaining earth uh, when looking at a retaining wall. Um, what is behind the wall will depend on the load that is applied to the wall. So is the ground cohesive? Is it granular? Uh, is it a made ground? Now, predominantly on the schemes that we are going to be talking about today, they are, exist they are existing basements that are being extended or the ground floor is going to be removed. So we need to prop the wall in the temporary condition um, to replace the propping action of the ground floor slab. So typically speaking, it's going to be a made ground behind the wall because that must have been how they, they would have had to excavate to build the wall in the first place. Uh, but obviously it depends on the type of wall when, I, when I'm saying that. Um, that's not always the case. So a lot of factors to consider on what's actually behind the wall. And it's quite often on these sorts of schemes where we will receive a, the SI report from the site and all the SI has been taken at the basement level down. So we may need to consider additional SI behind the retaining wall because it may well have been missed. Um, other, other things are obviously 
are there other basements behind these walls? Um, and they may well impact, well, it might, it might, it may be that you don't need to put props in certain places because the load isn't there. Um, surcharge, um, is obviously key when considering the design of a basement, uh, a basement retaining wall. Um, we may have roads, other infrastructure and buildings, um, next to the retaining wall, which obviously had add high additional loads to the wall that we need to consider in our design. Um, in addition to that, we've got things such as construction activities, um, which may load the wall. So cranes that are going to be having our rig loads nearby, um, gantries or facade retentions. Um, obviously if you're doing a massive construction project, that, that these are likely load cases that are going to impact your structure. Uh, so that all needs to be considered. And the, the other one is obviously the props that we design need to be robust and potentially are going to be subject to impact loading from debris when the demolition works are undertaken. So any prop in needs to be, needs to consider this. So the types of, uh, basement, uh, types of, th th there are many types of basement retaining wall. Um, I'm going to pick on the two that we typically see on site when we're working on these schemes, which are masonry retaining walls and reinforced concrete retaining walls. Um, as I mentioned earlier, essentially we need to know, um, how the existing structure works to enable us to prop it. Um, so we SI on the walls, uh, is key. Um, to identify how the structure currently works. I mean, masonry spans differently horizontally to vertically. There's different capacities. Um, so that, that's a big factor. And with, re with the reinforced concrete, obviously how it's reinforced makes a big difference to how the, it works. And we need to know that really to provide a more efficient design. Otherwise we will be designing a replica uh, or re uh, what's the word replicating the current load path um without the knowledge that could potentially uh reduce the amount of props that are needed because it's possible to reduce the props and maybe you don't need props maybe the retaining wall was designed to work as a cantilever um but in, until we know about the wall and about the structure, we, we don't know that. So understanding what the structure is, is, is key. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about, um, flying shores and raking props, which are the two main, uh, ways of propping, uh, basement retaining walls. And there are advantages and disadvantages to each. Um, and sometimes the optimum solution would be a bit of both as it were. Um, so fl flying shores, um, don't introduce any vertical component to the wall, whereas a raking prop would, um, which is beneficial. Um, they resolve the lateral forces in a similar way to the current structure propping both sides in a similar way to the propping action of a floor slab. Um, depending on the, <laughs> depending on the span or the, the width of the opening, um, there may be a need for intermediate supports to, um, these props, uh, which you can see actually in, in, in the photo on the right from one of our past schemes, um, in the middle, uh, you can see there's, there's intermediate supports to the, the props to reduce their size. Um, but obviously these take up a lot of space on site and can often cause clashes. So not always the best solution. Um, raking props are typically more compact uh, than flying shores and can be adjusted to a lot of situations. Um, however, they reduce the, uh, uh, they produce a vertical component, which may cause issues, particularly when fixing into masonry. Um, when fixing into masonry, it, 
we typically end up detailing a tie down detail. So you fix a, a tie against the wall and uh, anchor into the bottom of the masonry. So you've got the additional capacity um, from that. Um, the other thing is that they can perhaps require a thrust block or a surface that they can prop off at basement level. Um, I'll go in, into detail shortly on a construction sequence that we've devised that shows a good example of how we can prop off a new structure and how complicated sequencing is. Um, the, the big question, I suppose, is uh, when we're devising these propping schemes is proprietary propping or fabricated steel. Um, it tends to come from our clients and is, is heavily dependent on essentially time and, and money. Um, uh, essentially, there's a, there's a crossover time between fabricated steel and uh, proprietary equipment where fabricated steel becomes cheaper, typically sort of 10 months into a project. But it, again, this varies depending on what you're doing and the size of the props, et cetera, and who the supplier is. Um, wherever pos possible, we would push for a, a proprietary system for the, the potential for reuse, um, but that's not always feasible in the long term uh, or on the longer projects. So th th this is uh, an indicative sequence that we've, or this is the sequence from a past project that we've worked on um, that just explains how complicated this can get and, and all the different phases of support to a retaining wall um, that there may well be. <laughs> so first of all, we've got a, um, a berm in place, uh, which is essentially compact, compacted demolition horizons um, that's been put in to the basement um, and we've got a, a whaler installed uh, at the top which is, is yet to be propped. Um, following that we've got so it's, it's a sequential removal um, in an underpinning sequence um, working along the wall um, removing the basement slab and removing the berm locally uh, to enable the construction of underpins um, because they're extending the basement in, in this scheme. Uh, the next phase after all the underpins were constructed is to uh, excavate further down in the centre of the site and install the new permanent works foundations and then install props off that structure um, to our retaining wall. Um, or whilst this is in place, we've got a, 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 a different type of berm to the first, or a different berm to the first berm, which enables them to go down deeper on the, uh, in the center of the site. Um, obviously there's phasing in between these phases, but I'm just trying to give you a general gist of the complexities. So following this, um, we would locally remove um, sections along the wall and replace with the, a lower prop in this, in this scenario um, to enable the rest of the structure, or to enable the berm to be removed, which would be sequential. And then once that prop's in place, um, we could, we can come along and install the remainder of the basement slab. Um, and then we need to start constructing the new retaining wall uh, because obviously the existing retaining wall is not designed to span from top to bottom <coughs> or over this height. Um, so the sequence shows that we can sequentially install a phase or that the lowest section of wall remove the prop and essentially repeat working up the structure. Um, the retaining wall required intermediate su uh, support um, during this 
and eventually was completed um, following our sequence. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on uh, one of the case studies, which is Keybridge House, where it's quite a, a long while ago now, but it was a very complex scheme that I worked on. Um, it must be close to or complete now, I would, I would suggest. Um, so this project had, uh, it was a 12 meter basement. So it was two uh, six meter floors. Um, and the outer walls uh, consisted of diaphragm uh, concrete walls, uh, con concrete diaphragm walls, um, which I've highlighted in, per in, in red on the Google Maps image on the right. So that is the outer wall that you can see on the ground floor slab um, and the basement B1 slab. Um, just for a context of scale, it's obviously a very large project. <coughs> um, so if, we, if you look at the ground floor slab and the basement B1 floor slab views, the pale um, red is the areas that the client needed to demolish. And the, the green is the new cause of the new structure. Um, so you can see we've got a very com complicated scenario where we've got to support a, a, a large portion of the existing slab because they're demolished in a few columns. We need to pick up the edges of the current slabs. And we also need to restrain the wall. And we're in a condition where um, a large section of the slab is going to remain in place, which is going to stiffen the structure a lot. So it's not like we're propping a wall without, uh, or it's not like we're totally taking the slab out. So there's, we, we could provide a more efficient scheme by considering the effects of the ground floor and basement slab that were to remain, <coughs> which to a degree acted as a large beam uh, to the wall. Um, on this scheme, we pr uh, provided several concepts, including a heavy duty flying shore pro um, flying shores across the openings, uh, which was our preferred option at the time. But um, due to constraints on site, um, it, wa it was decided by the site team it, it wasn't an option. So we ended up um, with a hybrid essentially of at the higher level at the ground floor slab where the loads were less, there were a few uh, flying shores, which I've highlighted in the blue blocks um, on the screen on the left. And on the basement B1 level, there was a, a lot of raking props, uh, which I'll go into detail in a little bit more now. So this is the, the raking props installed on site um, to give it, uh, again, for a sense of scale, the floor to ceiling height is near six meters on here. So these props are roughly 10 meters long. Um, and key in this design was constructability because these were very heavy props and we need to make sure it could be installed well. Um, and in addition to that, because they're obviously very large props and very large loads, we've got a very high um, vertical component uh, in shear to resist. Um, so we we devised a, a system that used local brackets. So the brackets went al along the basement wall at the locations of the raking props. And then a the whaler was placed up against the, these brackets and the props were placed, which you can see in the center of the screen, um, against an angle uh, section so that they there was a degree of rotation to it, Im improve uh, constructability. Um, and of course, key, key to this is the, the line of action, which I've shown in the, the red uh, line on the sections from our drawings uh, to make sure that it was a solid, um, robust system and there was no way that the, the props could rotate and there was no prying action on, on our system. Um, but yeah, a very heavy duty propping scheme and 
uh, yeah, it went well. <laughs> um, this one's from another project. Um, I, I wasn't involved in this one, but it's it's quite an interesting way of supporting the retaining wall. Um, essentially, we have left the bay of the structure in place and sort of made it into a, a truss um, by installing props as close to node to node as possible. So this, the, we utilize the existing structure in a, in a clever manner to limit and reduce the amount of temporary works massively. <coughs> um, this one is, is thankfully nothing to do with us. Um, it, we received a call um, from our one of our clients who was, uh, I, no, I, don't th I think it was, I, I would describe it as a worried man called, <laughs> um, called the office number. And we attended the site and essentially the, their builder had been constructing a basement for, and had no engineering input at all. And you can see that the, uh, essentially that they hadn't restrained the retaining walls sufficiently and the walls that they, the, the side walls of the holes that they had dug had moved in and you can see the cracking into the neighbor's structure. Um, these are the photos that I took when we, um, well, obviously we couldn't go inside. I was actually in a neighbor on the road behind garden with the fire brigade looking at the house. Um, I believe the solution that they uh, the, uh, eventually came up with was to pour a foam concrete into the basement to uh, stabilize everything. But I, yeah, obviously engineering input is a must when it comes to these sorts of schemes to avoid uh, situations like this. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to uh, my colleague Dave now, and he's going to take it from there. Thank you very much. So yeah, if you, I'll just share my screen if you could stop sharing yours. Yes. Hopefully you can see my screen now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about two projects. The first one I'm going to discuss is Landmark in Manchester, which we completed a, a couple of years back. I think it's been subject to some other webinars regarding the actual pull down of the trust, but I'm going to look at the actual basement propping here. So and this project actually won the Northwest ICU Constructability Award back in 2019. So our involvement in the project started with the demolition of the previous structure where we were um, uh, working for Foreshore, and then we followed on with the principal contractor Bowman and Kirkland during the actual construction of the new structure. So the previous site uh, was an old 1920s theatre. You can see there in the centre, it's next to the National Library. And we were involved with the demolition of that, which I'll just touch on in a little bit. And, the, um, and then I'll go into the basement propping and how that was quite an interesting project. So yeah, this site is in the centre of Manchester and yeah, quite close to the, the central station. The So the demolition, the kind of, key part of this was actually the demo or the uh, safe removal of a 20 ton truss which spanned over the auditorium so this was yeah spanning about 30 meters the springing points of that truss as you can see are kind of well above ground level i think they're about 12 meters up and we looked at a number of ways to remove that truss uh, and the the best solution that we'd come up with was a controlled pull down so this kind of it was a short-term risk during the actual pull down but you could set exclusion zones and it kind of eliminated the or limited the amount of work at height that had to be undertaken if you were to dismantle this with a large crane so it was kind of through the eric principles of reducing the risk of the temporary works even something that seems like quite a risky kind of task can be made safe and actually is safer than the other alternatives so this was pulled down I believe it's in other webinars. There's videos of this that can be seen. I'm sure Christian would love to plug the other old webinars on YouTube. So you can I'll go back and have a look. I'll put some links in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
So on to the bit that we're interested in today. So the basement construction. So uh, as you can see, the there was an existing basement on the site and this was being deepened as part of the works. And as you can see, it was a variety of wall types throughout the basement structure. Some contact piles that were installed, some with a capping beam, some without, some concrete retaining walls and some masonry retaining walls. So we kind of cover a little bit of everything in this project. But the general principle of the proposal was to excavate down the center of the site, moving a berm against all the retaining walls to provide temporary restraint. We would then prop those retaining walls from that central section of slab and that would allow us to excavate the berm sequentially, add the second level of props to the base of the wall, carry out the underpinning, which it will touch on in a bit, and then construct the remainder of the slab. So you can see some of the pictures from the, the start of the work there, the propping of the, the contig wall on the right there, and the propping of some of the masonry walls on the other side. So this shows as the site moved on the section, you've got the tower crane in, but the key challenges here were the actual coordination. So we looked at the existing walls, we had some reasonable SI, and we could justify these walls spanning laterally, which reduced the need for whalers running laterally along the masonry walls. And in sections, we obviously could look at the contig piles and the new capping beams and review those. And you can see there as they've deepened the basement off that central section of slab, you can see them starting to sort out the casting. So there were four main types of propping on this project. Um, there's the kind of the blue raking props around the majority of the structure. You've got the, the green props there at the top, which are kind of single props up to the top of the capping beam. Red props, which show where the contig piles didn't have a capping beam and where we used some horizontal whalers to restrain all the contig piles. And finally, there were some knee braces and flying shores used in the corners of the site where that was useful and kind of the most economic way to do the propping. So looking at the raking props, so there was a number of types here, but this first one used a kind of a tie down, which James has discussed a bit to kind of transfer the vertical component from the prop. We used fabricated steel and we used some proprietary jacks because that kind of provided the most cost effective um, methodology. The jacks provide a little bit of adjustment and a small amount of preload to the propping system to make sure it's all tight prior to removing the berm. And these uh, vertical soldiers could then, with a bit of coordination with the permanent works consultant who were curtains on this job, we could cast those into the liner wall and that meant that they could stay there and the, it kind of made for an easy construction methodology where you just had to box out where the props went in and infill that at a later date. And here you can see the other types of raking props onto the contig wall, where you've got the, the horizontal whalers coming across. And that is clearly not me because I'm covering for this presentation for someone else, but you can see the cropping there um, installed and working very well. And they've just started installing the, the basement slab. So moving on to the tighter corners of the site where you've got the flying shores, you can see there that we've used some box sections and you can see the, the pivot points and the jacks in situ and how it is, it's not a terribly kind of, it's quite a congested site, but how the propping has been installed enables the actual construction of the works around it. It's not getting in the way, it's installed at the right level to allow the permanent works to be constructed, which is, a lot of the coordination issues. And finally, you can see the capping beam props up at the top end in that picture there. Um, and as the, you can see the excavator is sequentially removing the berm. So they were the, the main types of the props. Now, the complicated bit of these schemes is quite often not the propping itself, but the construction of the permanent works around the propping and why this needs to be considered. So, um, this image shows a bit of the underpinning. Um, so the underpinning provided a third level of restraint because that was dowelled into or fixed into the structural blinding at the base prior to the slab being cast. It was also dowelled into the wall. So we've got kind of three levels of restraint to the retaining wall there. And this reduced the, or eliminated the need for a further level of propping. 
So this shows a bit about the constructability. So where possible, we used risers uh, or door openings or position the props in risers or door openings to reduce the need for kind of patch up work after the installation. But you can see them kind of constructing the, the B2 and B1 levels here. And it shows some of the props moving through these levels and the kind of the permanent works being constructed around it. But it is a very complicated sequence and we kind of took meticulous care to allow this to to come about and there was a lot of sequencing involved with the removal of the props so the transfer of the load from those props to the pump works ensuring that the structure was constructed to a state where it could take those loads when it was when the props were removed and involved uh, a collaborative approach with the pump works designer that's just a, a further image of the construction And yeah, the project is now completed. You can see that kind of sequence of events there from the old 1920s theatre through the construction to a, an image of the, the final structure, or at least an artist's impression of the final structure. So moving on to the second project. So this is just a brief one of how we can eliminate temporary works or how we would, the, the best form of temporary works is no temporary works is using the existing structure to restrain itself with minimal additional propping. So this was a project called Old Granada Studios, and we're gonna look at the, the section on the left-hand side here circled, where we did an initial concept for some propping, which was very heavy because we didn't know about the structure, and then we got the additional SI, and that enabled a, uh, a more efficient Propping scheme. It involved a lot more design work. And I guess what I would like to emphasize here is that the, the cheapest design fees may result in the most expensive solution on site. So paying a little bit more for your design is not a terrible thing. And the initial concept with limited SI. So this was a, a another basement, strangely enough. And there was a canal tunnel adjacent to it with a road on top. So without any SI, we our initial concept was to prop for the full thrust load of the arch, surcharge loading from the road, and that resulted in some fairly heavy props, as you can see on the right there. And that was prior to us getting access to have a look at the tunnel. As you can see, even in that drawing, we said that we need to carry out some surveys to confirm the, the extent of this. So we carried out some surveys, lots of kind of views of this tunnel, and it wasn't what we expected. It wasn't a full arch anymore. It had been repurposed as a bomb shelter. There were a number of concrete diaphragm walls and the arch had actually been cut. So in the top, you can see the demolition, what, what needed to be removed to enable the new structure. And we tried to utilize the, both the existing shear walls or the blast walls from the bomb shelter and reinforced with temporary works in these orange areas here on that bottom right hand picture to provide, use those as shear walls to restrain the thrust of the arch. And this kept all of the temporary works outside of the actual basement that was being constructed. So there were no props that would then cause issues with the, the construction and reduce the amount of propping. So it provided a much cheaper solution, although there was a lot more design work involved with it. It's, much more complicated to do this analysis than it is just to design a raking prop to a thrust block. So the final design that was come or that was produced involved some kind of braces between the doorways, the shear walls to stiffen those up. And actually where those shear walls didn't require access again, we just kind of infilled them with block work. It's a simple solution that kind of gave us the capacity that we required. And here we've got some pictures of the propping installed. So yeah, it's not, they're, they're not the smallest of props, but they are um, out of the way from the new construction works and could be removed afterwards. So quite a sustainable option. And I believe that brings us to the end of this presentation. So I'm just gonna go over a bit of what we provide. We can, it's better to get us involved at tender stage or early on in the project so we can provide these solutions prior to the design being midway down the road. And the, the more time we have to carry out this 
design work, the better the solution is going to be and the more influence we can have to make it the best solution possible to make sure your project both is achieved on time and for the cheapest possible cost in the long run. And yeah, we can provide all of these kind of solutions. We've seen enough uh, case studies of basements to know that we definitely do it. Um, yeah, provide all the checks necessary and provide support on site. So if you want to know more, there's a variety of links here. I'm sure Christian will link some in the chat if needed, or if anyone needs more information, there is, there's plenty 